have some exciting information, some news articles that we want to kind of run past you. So, Patrick, it's good to have you here this afternoon. Eric, I have never seen the interest in this business uh, in the 23 years we've been in business like right now. People are anxious to start their own business. They're tired of working for other people. They know that they don't have any security there. This is a great crowd here today, and this is a terrific webinar because we're going to cover, like you said, some really relevant stuff here that uh, Eric found here out on the internet just, just the other day. So uh, talk about yes. relevancy. This is going to be something you guys can really tune into and say, you know what, I guess this really is something I need to get involved in. Absolutely. So let's, let's jump right on there. There's actually a couple of articles here, folks, that we want to uh, draw your attention to. Before we get to there, we're going to remind you of two things. At the end of, the, of today's webinar, we're going to have a handout in the handout drop box. So um, for those that can stay till the, all the way to the end, we're going to drop that in there. You'll have this to show to a partner or just for your own study for later on. And again, we want to remind you that we want to hear from you. So although we see all of these names that are in the question box area, anytime during the webinar, please feel free to ask your questions. So let's get right into there. Now I just pulled this one. This is one you think, well, this was back in October of 2016. But folks, you got to remember a lot of the research that's done for like 2017 always happens at the end of that current year. Patrick, I came across this one, and then we're going to show another one here that's even more relevant. But here it says medical billing outsourcing market could reach uh, $16.9 billion by 2024. That's a Man, huge market, Patrick. That is a big pie. You know what I tell people, look, if you're thinking about getting into business, you need to get into something that has a growth projected like, like this because that means that you know uh, you get your slice of that pie and uh, you are right in the smack dab middle of, of a growth industry. And look, it was marketed uh, valued at $6.3 billion in 2015. So yes. what is that? Is that like $10.6 billion growth uh, yes. by, by the year 2024? And folks, we have to think long term because this industry is uh, an industry that will be around. It's been around for a long time. It will continue to be around as long as there's people who get sick. Uh, they have to go to the doctor. The doctor has to bill somebody to get paid, uh, whether it's the insurance companies or the government agencies uh, like Medicare and Medicaid right now. It could be others in the future. But the point is somebody has to bill them to get paid, and you well, can just be a part of that. Yeah, and actually, Patrick, the good thing about this is, I know that you and I talk about this probably every week, but here are third-party companies that have actually gone out and done some research. This one's done by the beckershospitalreview.com. You can, folks, y'all can see that down at the bottom. And for those that can hang out and get the, the uh, handout towards the end, you'll have a copy of this and you can take a look at it. But it says below are four takeaways from the report. Now, we only put one and two right there because those are the most relevant to us. But... Number one, it says North America experienced the largest surge in its medical billing outsource market growth this in 2015. So that was 2015. Changing regulations and rising healthcare costs have driven interest in financial service providers. So, Patrick, there is a, a, a push for doctors to outsource their medical billing. Yeah, now for those new to this whole industry, think about it this way. Uh, can doctors do their own billing? Yes, and some of them do. They have their own software, computers, they have people that they've hired in their office that's actually doing that billing. Is that their core competency? No, but they have to do it to get paid. Now, a lot of doctors are realizing more and more, as this is indicating right here, that the growth is right now huge. Uh, that they were deciding, that, hey, let's get this out of the office, let's outsource it to somebody else in the community, uh, like yourself, that can do the billing for the doctor so that they, they can focus on seeing patients. That's where they make their money, right? The more patients they see, the more uh, revenue they have. And you're going to help them on the back end by building the insurance companies and getting that money in the door. Yeah. And, and then number two is, is further stating, for those that are looking and reading, you can see that there's a greater number of independent physicians practicing, you know, they're, what they're trying to do is consolidate, which means that they're getting that out of their office, that, that billing part out of their office, consolidating to increase market power to ensure financial stability. And it goes on to say this trend has created a need for, look at that, Patrick, third-party financial management services to administer the increasing complex revenue cycle needs. 
Yeah, now let, let, me, let me talk about revenue cycle. That's a good term that some people may not be familiar with. The revenue cycle in a doctor's office is everything that has to do with getting paid. It could be involved uh, the patient collections. It could be the insurance companies. Uh, finding that money and getting that into the doctor is tougher than it seems. In fact, a lot of doctors are not collecting but about 70% of the money that they right. could be collecting. Now imagine they're leaving 30% of their revenue uh, on the operating table. Uh, so we can help them with that. You can help with that. You can get that up to 98% collections, which is, of course is more money in their pocket. The more money they make, uh, the more money you make. All right, so if that wasn't good enough, uh, this one right here, Patrick, this next one. Uh, folks, you can see this is a PR Newswire. Uh, this is one that just came out uh, at the beginning of this year. And this is from, and we've used this company before. It's called Black Book, and they, they, they do research and surveys and all of this. And so this is their new one that they just finished up in 2016. Patrick, it says here, accelerating number of physicians select outsource revenue cycle management services to align clinical and financial outcomes shows Black Book survey on a valued-based care prep. Yeah, and, lo and look at the, the, the little subheading there, folks. Uh, imagine this. They're saying that the outsourcing of comprehensive medical business office services, that's the billing, uh, is staged to grow 30% from practices of less than 25 doctors next year. Eric, that just happens to be our golden target market, isn't it? Doctors' offices that have exactly. less than 25 doctors. Now, not that yep. we haven't had license to sign up clinics and uh, groups, practices that are more than 25 doctors. We have, but more than likely, it's, it's less than 25 doctors. And wow, 30% growth, Eric. Again, I, it's unheard of. If you were trying to get into any industry right now, I, I doubt that you could find one that says credibly that there's going to be a 30% growth. Right. Now, here are, we, we, we pulled out three of the percentages that they found, uh, and these are kind of shocking, Patrick, so I'm going to pull up this first one, and I'll just let you take it because it's just unbelievable. Go ahead. Yeah, well, this one here, for example, <laughs> that's a good percentage of anything, 100%, right? 100%, folks, that's all of them. Of the 224 participating new physicians, seek alternatives to office financial and staff management as they launch their new practices. Now, Eric, this is talking about new doctors fresh out of medical school. 100% of the 224 they surveyed said, no, I'm not going to do this in-house. I'm going to outsource yep. this. So. The younger guys out there are getting smart and realizing, hey, I don't need to focus on that. That's not my core competency. I'll focus on getting patients well and let somebody else who's a specialist in this uh, deal with that. And then it goes on to say outsourcing their billing right out of the gate is giving the new generation of physicians and practitioners the much needed relief from the day-to-day -day stress of launching a new practice without a trial by fire in hiring, training, and managing the employees. That is a huge headache. Eric, uh, as the CEO of our company, I can tell you, with present company accepted, every extra employee that you hire is another headache. Sure. And so why do it if you don't have to? That means, folks, that the doctor doesn't have to hire one or two, sometimes three or four people to sit in his office and do that billing. That takes up space, resources, uh, it cost him a lot of money, not just salaries, but you got all the overhead and benefits that you give those people as well. Insurance, vacation time, et cetera, et cetera. You eliminate all that by outsourcing. Yep. Okay, so folks, I hope you got that one snapshot in your head. Again, we're going to have this as a handout later on for you. And, and folks, we haven't even gotten into the meat of the webinar. We're just trying to give you some good information here. Look at this one. So Patrick, this one says 77% of physicians believe they need to find more uh, direct patient care time currently taken up by business office related issues. Many doctors are not strong on the business side of running the practice, huh, outsourcing the billing. <laughs> I don't know it. Outsourcing the billing process eliminates the managerial hassles and frees doctors to concentrate on patients. Eric, in, in our live workshops, I ask this question. Uh, we do have sometimes a few people who come who do have some connection to doctor's offices. Maybe they've worked in there 
uh, maybe not in billing, but in some aspect of a doctor's office. And I always ask, them, how many of you have worked for doctors? Maybe two or three people in a class hold up their hands. Okay, now can you guys verify for me that doctors are not the best business people in the world? That's why I laughed when you read that about not strong on the business side. They're not, and they, they weren't trained to do that, right? They were trained to take care of the human body and know all about the human body and health and so forth. So it's a good thing. It's a good thing for us and for our licensees that the doctors are not good on the business side because, well, that's why they all uh, are deciding that they should outsource their billing. Yep. One last one, and we'll get it right over into everything else. And then it goes on here. One of the other statements, it says, it's 95 of practices with less than five physicians self-identify as not tech savvy. Yeah. Financial investments in hardware and applications, training, regular software upgrades, and the occasional technical issues are too much to handle, according to most small groups. Patrick, that's Isn't why that our software... News? I'm sorry? Isn't that great news for us? Oh, <laughs> great news for us, because that's what we're going to get into. Our software is a web-based system. They don't even have to worry about the upgrades or the technical issues that they have to have with regular software type applications. Right, as long as they, as long as our, our licensees, as long as people who are on this webinar that get into this business, as long as they can connect to, to Amazon and purchase something on Amazon, you can run our software. That's all yeah. it takes is a browser that connects to the internet. And boom, you're, you're on our system. We're gonna show you some uh, sli uh, slides or screenshots of the system here in just a moment too. Yeah, absolutely. So folks, I hope you got that information down. If not, again, this is recorded. You can go back and listen to it later. We're going to have a handout for you here in a little while, but uh, we just we just thought we'd give you this information. It's going to be helpful for you as you're making your decision about what you want to do. All right, so let's get ready to start back in here. So starting a healthcare business, uh, learn from the experts. The first thing we're going to talk about, Patrick, because a lot of people are, have a little bit of misconception about what medical billing really is. So we're going to first of all talk about what it's not. I think that's probably the best thing is what, what medical billing is really not, uh, what you don't have to be involved in. Yeah, and the reason we're starting with this, folks, is because there are some misconceptions. Uh, when people start looking into doing medical billing, they have all these misconceptions about what they might have to get involved in, and we want to point out why you don't have to get involved in things like, well, the first one here, for example. You do not have to code the claims. Now, everybody knows that there are codes, right, these numbers uh, that, that uh, the doctor gives uh, to you as a patient. When you leave, they give you a little sheet called a super bill that has all these numbers on there. Well, those are codes that are tied to uh, not only what's wrong, what the doctor found wrong with you and your body, but what procedures they performed on your body to help you get well, like a shot or a manipulation or, or whatever. So you don't have to be involved in these codes. Let's talk about the differences, Eric, uh, sure. uh, in people's minds at least, about people who do have to get involved in the codes. Yeah, so what we're going to show you here is the difference between a medical coder and then that of a medical biller. Because as a medical coder, coder, you actually have to go become a certified professional coder. Now, there may be some of you here on the webinar this afternoon or might listen to us a little bit later. You know exactly what it is because some of you might be a certified professional coder. But folks, you don't have to do that. But let's just talk about what, a, what they have to do. They take the doctor's notes and then they turn those codes, like Patrick said, into numerical medical codes. So it's what the doctor, like Patrick says, what they did for you. You know, there's a there's a certain diagnosis. Either you got uh, heart disease, high blood pressure, you know, you've got kidney stones, whatever it is. That's your diagnosis. So that code's there, and then a procedure. The difference between a coder and a biller, the biller is the one that takes those codes takes the codes, inputs those codes into a billing system for payment. They're not coding, they're just taking those and inputting them into a system. Yeah, so one is a professional who's been trained, maybe they went to a, a course at, at a junior college, and they learned about coding, uh, they got a little certificate that says they're a, a certified medical coder. I like this lady here, unless she's actually looking the codes up in a book because, hey, they do change, and so she has to keep relevant on that, but she's making sure that the codes match what the doctor says he or she did find wrong with the patient. The one on the right is simply taking the information that she gets from the doctor and inputting it. She's a data entry person, basically. 
Uh, so I tell people, you're going to be the most expensive, I should say not expensive, not to the doctor, it's cheap to the doctor, but you're going to be the most well-paid data entry person uh, in your entire city because you take that information and just put it in accurately into our system and the doctor gets paid. Absolutely. And we also know that it's really the doctor's responsibility to provide those medical codes to the billing company. Uh, you know, Patrick, it gets down to the bottom line. Even though that a doctor may have a certified professional coder that actually does the codings, it's still that doctor's responsibility to make sure those codes oh, yeah. are correct. Uh, yeah, you bet. And, and so when people ask us, well, how do I come up with the codes? You don't. In fact, right. you don't want to be responsible for those codes. They could be that you're picking the wrong code and trying to get overcharged, you know, the, overcharge the insurance company for that code. And that's called, uh, well, overcoding. And when right. you do that, the doctor can get fined up to $10,000. So you don't want to be the person who's responsible for the codes. You want to be just the well-paid uh, data entry person who's taking the codes that the doctor gave you. Now, there are going to be times when a doctor is not quite sure. Now, if he's been in practice any period of time, he probably knows all of his codes pretty well. But, as I said, they change from time to time. So what does he do then? Well, we just happen to have come up with a couple things that allow you to go in and service the doctor and help him or her decide what the code should be. Yeah. And we, have, yeah we, we have certified medical coders uh, yeah. that are ready to help you help the doctor. One of them is called Code Right. And that's where we actually go in and pick some of the doctor's uh, uh, patient records and look at what the codes are that the doctor needs to be using to get paid correctly. They can undercode as well, and that means they're leaving money on the table. Uh, but tell them about Audit Guard too, Eric. That's a good one to tie in with code writing. Yeah, Audit, Audit Guard is, is where it kind of goes in and, and looks at past codes that the doctors used, and, and they're going to really look at the notes. So there's where we go in and get a sampling of the doctor's Co notes of their past maybe 30 days and so a, a certified coder would have to look at that do a, an actual audit very close like what a Medicare audit would look like and it's really going to show the doctor where they kind of align are they are they as you can see there on the on the the, the flyer there where it says stop under billing well that's what we're talking improve reimbursements those are the things that, that can happen with audit guard and that can be helpful now I'm gonna go over to one of the questions or actually one of the statements that Victor is making and uh, Victor says having the codes programmed into the software will remove her human error just keep the software updated the good thing about it Victor there's two things that about our system that is that's very very good that is our system always has the updates for the, the medical billing company for you and if the doctor's using the electronic medical record side of it that it's actually coding for the doctor anyway so it really takes out the human error on both sides the doctor side and the billing side so these two services folks are uh, a handful of ancillary services that we've come up with that you can offer to the doctor you don't have to they're always optional but think about it this way you would have to do a lot of research and spend a lot of money trying to coordinate with companies that can provide these types of services to doctors. We've done all that for you. And you make money on all these services as well. So you offer them to the doctor. It's a great benefit to them. You make money on it. We make money on it. Uh, it's a win-win it's a for everybody. Yeah. Now, Patrick, let's move into one other area where I think a little some, the, like you mentioned earlier, some misconceptions about what a medical billing company actually does. And... I have a lot of people ask me, am I going to be having to call up that little old lady who won't pay her medical bill? <laughs> Where's that $20 you owe the doctor, Mrs. Jones? <laughs> yes, and no, you don't have to collect past due accounts uh, from the insurance companies or from the patients. Folks, that's out of your hands. You're not going to be a collection agency. So that's a misconception because people think, oh, well, am I going to have to deal with all the patients? Am I going to have to deal with the insurance companies? Well, you may make a phone call from time to time to, to an insurance company, but you're not begging. You're just following up on claims that have already been submitted, and maybe they've been rejected. So you're following up on those claims. Now, that's just a part of this business, and that's why you can charge great amounts of money to a doctor for doing this service. Billing for a doctor is based on how much money you collect for the doctor. So you want it to be maximized, right, as much as possible. 
So uh, since you're charging anywhere from usually 5 to 8 percent, that's the national average, I guess, you are collecting that money because you want a portion of that. And so there's a motivation for you to do that. Hey, by the way, Eric, there's yep. no motivation for that lady that's sitting in the doctor's office doing it internally. They, they don't have any incentive to get that money because they don't get paid a percentage of money that's collected. It's just their job yep, that's to right. do their job. Yeah, absolutely. But however, if and when needed, there are some alternatives to help the doctor get past, you know, do things, past due monies, or help the doctors stay current with the patients as they're trying to get that money out of pocket from, from, the, from the patients. The, the quick collect is kind of working with some past due. So it, instead of sending a, a patient to a, uh, a collection agency, the doctors don't want to do that. They, they want to keep that patient, doctor-patient relationship clean. So right. use quick collect. It, it's just a, it's a, it's a very well time tested, uh, automated way in to get past dues and just help patients remind that they owe the doctor some money. Choice pay is more of a proactive way that it, it can actually deduct money directly from the patient's credit card on a monthly basis or their bank account or savings, however they want to do that. I know a lot of health savings accounts are out there, so this would be the one of the ways to pull that money from those accounts and keep the, the patient current with the doctor. Yeah, and we haven't talked about our system yet. Uh, we're going to touch on this a little bit later, but folks, choice pay is actually built into our system. In other words, it's a yeah. part of the patient portal that the patients will have access to, and they can go online and look at their balances and pay right online through choice pay. So it's a wonderfully integrated system. Yeah. One other thing before we get into some of the things that you have, you will be doing as a medical billing company, and that is this, Patrick, nobody has to handle the doctor's money. Right. And you don't want to do that. Believe me, folks, that's the last thing you want to do is get involved in the cash flow. Now, Eric, having said that, I have some horror stories I can tell you about medical billing companies who set it up so that the money came to them from the insurance companies, and then they put that money that's due the doctor in their account all kinds of horror stories about uh, things that went horribly wrong there. So we don't do that, folks. The way it's set up with us is you bill the insurance companies, the insurance company pays the doctor directly. And I think you have pictures about that. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So you don't handle the doctor's money at all. Uh, they're paying directly to the doctor, putting it sometimes electronically right into their bank account. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so there's no, no handling money. Folks, remember, you're processing claims in order for the doctor to get paid. Let that money go back to them because at the end of the month through our system, you're going to be able to know how much money that actually went into the doctor's bank uh, because it's all coming back through the system to let you know about that. So the money's going to the doctor's account, but the accounting actually comes back on our side. So you'll know exactly how much that doctor got. And you can reconcile that between the doctor's bank account and, and what's in our system. And so you can always do that. The doctors obviously want to make sure that they're paying you uh, correctly. So that's that's how the money flows there. And, and since you can give access to the system, to the doctor, him or herself, they can log in and see the real-time status of their money anytime they want to. So when you send them a bill at the end of the month and say, hey, I collected uh, $923,000 for you this month, they can't dispute that. They can go in the system and actually look at that and verify that themselves. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's move on to the, the, the good part. Let's, let's talk about what you actually will be doing as a medical revenue manager. Now, Patrick, we've got medical revenue manager up there and not medical biller. You want to, again, quickly explain the difference between a biller and a medical revenue manager? Yeah, you can almost think of it as the same thing. Most people would refer to people uh, as medical billers, but folks, you're going to be much more than that. When we certify you, as you go through our training workshop here in Dallas, you're going to receive a certificate that says you are a certified medical revenue manager. That means you don't just deal with the billing of the insurance companies. You're managing the entire revenue cycle for the doctor, uh, mm -hmm. handling every aspect of the money that needs to be put into the doctor's account. So we just use that term because it makes it stand out, and you'll be the only certified medical revenue manager in your area because uh, that's unique to ABS licensees. Absolutely. All right, so let's talk about uh, a little bit about the history of medical billing, where it was, where it is today. Patrick, I know this is this is kind of giving a little bit of your history between you and Linda and, and how you guys kind of got started here. So uh, let's just jump right on in there and let's kind of talk about 
you know, the beginning part of how medical billing used to be done. Yeah, you know, uh, just mentioning that just for a second, Eric, it does remind me back in the late 80s, my wife started doing medical billing for one particular uh, medical provider, and then she started getting referrals, and we started building the business up, and it grew. And people wanted to know how we did what we had done and how we were making the kind of money we were making. So we developed a training program uh, that's been evolving over the 20, last 23 years to what we have now, where we can get people started a whole lot quicker than we did back in uh, you know 1994 when we first started uh, uh, doing that for folks. But yeah, the evolution of medical billing is interesting, folks, because basically you start with uh, well, the way we did it is we would get the doctor information from the doctor called a super bill. There it is illustrated on the screen. And that piece of paper has all you need to file that claim for that doctor. It has the information about the uh, uh, patient and then the insurance company and all the codes that you need. Well, back in the late 80s, I love your illustration there, Eric. <laughs> well, that's basically what my wife was doing, typing, not quite a manual typewriter, but we were using the typewriter to actually fill out the form that you see there on the right. It's called a 1500 form, and that's just a standard form the government came up with that kind of standardizes all the information that the insurance company need, as well as Medicare. So basically, if you can fill out that one form right there, that is an insurance claim. That's how simple that is. Yeah, and so what you'll see here through the process here is that, that form that's on the right-hand side, that red form there, a lot of people know it as a, the, 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 the CMS 1500 form or even in the back of the days, the HICFA form, uh, that's going to be electronic now. And you'll see that as we kind of process and go through the, through the years here. Uh, but still, during a part of time, Patrick, you, you kind of, you, I think, actually move from com typing it out to actually creating some little computer program that actually you put it in there and then it printed out. Yeah, I worked for Apple Computer back in the 80s and uh, when I left there they actually gave me a computer to take home with me and so I designed a database so my wife didn't have to use the typewriter. We would just put the data into the database uh, on the computer and then at the end of the day push a button that would then print out the forms. Again, we were still not doing it electronically, we were mailing those in to the insurance companies. And the amazing thing is, Eric, uh, a lot of those claims never got to the insurance company. The, the, the post office must have lost them because <laughs> oh, when we call up to follow up on them, they'd go, oh, we don't remember getting that. We don't have any record of that. Well, they can't do that nowadays with our cloud-based system. We can track it from one place to another. <laughs> Absolutely. Now we're kind of moving in a little bit ahead of where, where we are today and kind of showing some of the groundwork that's been laid out there. But it's still some of the same process, a little bit still. This is really, Patrick, how some doctors are still doing it today. They're yeah. still using a super bill, a piece of paper there when they're seeing their patients, and they hand that off to somebody either in their office or to their, their billing company, which they're going to input that into now what's called a practice management system. Uh, you know, that's, that's a little bit bigger than just the billing platform because it's kind of helping – keep all the patient data and everything. That's why it's called a practice management. I think sometimes they even got calendars in there. So so they entered into that uh, part of it. And uh, I'm not sure the date whenever a practice management system actually came into date. Do you kind of remember that? Was, was that back in the late 80s there too? Yeah, in the, in the 90s, of course, they developed a software that would connect to the Internet through a modem. Remember the old things that dialed up and made this horrendous sound connecting to the Internet? And then while, while it was connected through your phone lines, uh, it would send a batch of those claims to the uh, clearinghouse that you see there illustrated in the middle. The clearinghouse is a, a third-party form, a firm, that basically just looks at that data and uh, scrubs it, makes sure it's clean so it will pass uh, the insurance company's inspection. And so once it's verified everything, it, it then forwards it on to the insurance companies. And if it if it passes, the insurance company pays the claim to the doctor. Yeah. Now it's kind of a uh, little bit more tech because now the doctor, instead of using that piece of paper now, they're using what is known as electronic health records or electronic medical records, which they're kind of synonymous now. It's basically saying the same thing. But... Now they're putting their stuff in a computer system. I think the the early ons of this, Patrick, is is that we would have the doctor talk to us, and then they would turn around and go type, and then they would come back and talk, and then they'd go back and type. 
Yeah, I remember that. He lost all communication with the patient. I had a visit with a doctor, and he, he never said one thing. I mean, he didn't look at me at the, in the eye at all. He was always turned to Nowadays, with our system, of course, the doctor actually uses something like an iPad or a tablet and goes directly into our system. So they can be standing there using it as they're talking to the patient, and they're looking right at the patient because they've just got it right here in front of them. And so they can put that information in. It sends it directly to uh, our system, our cloud-based system, which then, of course, you've got the information that you need to forward that on uh, to the insurance companies. And what we're illustrating here, basically, folks, is this is the process that most doctors are using if they have an older type system. Right. And, and, the, and the interesting thing about this, Patrick, is is the only difference between this this screen and the previous screen is how the doctor inputs their information, whether it's on paper or electronic. But if, folks, if you'll kind of just get a mental snapshot here, follow along with me, get a mental snapshot, everything that's below stays the same. Computer systems, computer medical billing system, practice management, out, third, third party clearinghouse, insurance companies. It's the same process over, this is the conventional way of doing things. Because you gotta keep this in mind because we're gonna show you what makes you different. Why a doctor would use you over what they're currently doing here in just a moment. So we're gonna kinda of step you through that and we see a step-by-step -step internet online practice management system. That's what that stands for. So again, let's just kinda of follow how things go so you'll get a good understanding. Uh, again, we're just trying to give you a full benefit of understanding how medical billing happens. You, if you're doing that kind of process, you would go possibly pick up super bills and pay, uh, patient information forms that would be provided by the offer, office. That's either going to come to you in person, it can come with fax, it can come through a local delivery service. But Patrick, there is a better way, and that's what we want to kind of start talking to you about. There's no longer you have to go in person to go pick up stuff or have a delivery truck send it over to you. And, you know, it, it, there's just better ways of doing it. Now, they can send it to you electronically, get it into the system, and then, again, get it to a clearinghouse. Now, Patrick, I think you wanted to spend a little bit more time on explaining what a clearinghouse does, just so that everybody makes sure that they understand what this is all about. Yeah, all insurance companies want that data electronically in a different format. So a clearinghouse also reformats it. They're, they're the portal to all the insurance payers that the doctor is dealing with. So it intercepts any claims that have errors, and it sends that claim back to the originating medical billing program. So in a doctor's office that doesn't have our system, of course, because uh, we don't have a clearinghouse, it's all built into ours, they have to go wait for that data to come back from the clearinghouse, figure out what was wrong with it, correct it, and resubmit it to the clearinghouse. Now, if it passes, then the clearinghouse, uh, you know, sends it on. But otherwise, it's rejected. That's called, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a clean claim. It's a rejected claim. Right. Yeah, and so, the, as Patrick says, uh, those are claims that are just not paid there. So and a lot what... of those, Eric, by the yep. way, when they're sent back, they never get resubmitted. Uh, there's yeah. too much going on in the doctor's office. They're too busy, and so they lose that money, and the doctor has to write that off at the end of the year. They can Absolutely. be losing 30% of their revenue because their staff doesn't know how or doesn't take the time to resubmit those claims. In our system, we have a less than 2% rejection rate, not 30%, less than 2%. That's yep. extra money on the doctor's table. So, folks, after it leaves that clearinghouse, let's say that claim does get clean and it gets scrubbed and everything's fine with it, from their servers and everything else, then that's when it gets separated and it goes to either the government, Medicare, or Medicaid services, or it's going to go directly to the health insurance companies, again, for processing of those payments. Once they get through with that, again, this is how the doctor gets paid. So, imagine... The long process, the doctor sees the patient, they maybe wrote it out on a piece of paper, they've submitted it to their biller, they finally get it in their computer system, it goes from that system to a third party clearinghouse, it gets juggled through there, sometimes it might get sent back to the insurance company, I mean to the, to the medical billing company, or it goes on, gets to Medicare, Medicaid, or health, health insurance companies, finally getting to the doctor. Patrick. We've kind of looked at it at a ratio 
through the process that we're talking about there. That's that can be a 30 to 45 day turnaround for the doctor to finally get paid oh, once yes. they've actually seen the patient. Easily, yes. I've had doctors say that they've had money out there for you know 45 to 60 to 90 days before they see it. Uh, we've had doctors turn around and get their money through our system in less than seven days. So uh, it's it's amazing. Now the big question to people listening to this webinar should be. Well, how do I get my money? Where do I fit into this money flow right here? And that's Absolutely. real simple. Again, our system will tell you exactly what you need to bill the doctor for. The exact number will be in the system uh, based on the percentage that you're charging. When you send the invoice to the doctor, then the doctor will pay you. Now, Eric, some of our licensees have gotten smart, haven't they? They don't wait for a check from the doctor, do they? No, they're actually drawing that money directly from the doctor's bank account because, again, they can see what's going on. And so instead of sending a doctor an invoice, you're just saying, basically sending the doctor a statement saying, hey, I'm going to give you about 10 days to review this statement. If you think it's all good and clear or I'm here from you, I'm pulling in and drawing this money out from your bank account directly into my bank account. Yeah, they, they set that up with their bank, and we'll show you how to do that. It's called an ACH, uh, stands for Automated Clearinghouse. But anyway, basically, it's an electronic withdrawal from that doctor's bank account directly into your bank account. So. It's a wonderful system and a wonderful way to make a lot of money still working in your pajamas from yeah. your home. You yeah. have a lot of licensees uh, that still do that. Um, uh, and that kind of goes along with, uh, I hope I say your name correctly, Boo Pathia. Pathia. Uh, you asked the question, so when does the doctor pay us? Well, they're going to pay you <clears throat> after they get paid. So imagine if the doctor's getting paid 45 to 30 to 45 days out. You see, you're not getting paid until almost two months after you've processed that claim. Well, that, that's too much of a lag for you. Remember, that's through that whole process that Patrick and I just kind of demonstrated and, and illustrated out for you. However, we really do want to show you a, a little bit better way, and this is where the whole thing really takes on a completely different turn. That is because, Patrick, as you, as hopefully folks can see here, the clearinghouse is the billing system. The billing system is the clearinghouse. It's the best way I can put it. We don't have to send it to a third-party clearinghouse. We, it, it gets processed both inside the, the billing platform and the clearinghouse simultaneously, and then it's sent over to the insurance companies in real time. Yeah, so basically we took the technology that clearinghouses have and just put that into our system. So our system does all the examining and scrubbing of the claims to make sure that they're clean claims and that they will go through. And like I said, less than 2%, Eric, we've been using that less than 2% for so long, I hate to change it, but we have heard that it's less than 1% now. So right. uh, nationwide, that is the average. And folks, I know that's hard for a lot of people who've been in medical billing to, to believe or to understand. I've had people tell me, uh, you're lying. That, that's impossible. There's no way that you could have that low, less than 2% rejection rate. But folks, that's the facts. All I can tell you is that that's what our system shows nationwide. That is the facts. Absolutely. And in this scenario, Patrick, instead of that 35 to 45 day lag of getting paid, now we're, we've, we've shortened it down to 7 to 10 days. And sometimes it literally could be within five days that the doctor's getting paid. Yeah, that's right. Which I've means seen it that, that long. The, the, the bill, the uh, insurance claim was submitted on Monday, and the doctor had the money on Friday. It's yep. incredible. They they were blown away. This doctor that, that happened to said, "No, there's no way that that can happen." And, and sure enough, it does. <laughs> no, not every and, time, but that's a that's an illustration right. of how fast a cloud-based system can operate behind the scenes, especially when the clearinghouse is a part of the system. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very unique. People ask us all the time. What is it makes you unique in the marketplace? Well, there it is. Eric is illustrating it right now. We have the iClaim, which is the practice management system he mentioned earlier, that actually does the billing that you do. You work with that. The doctor works with the electronic medical record system that, that they illustrated there on the iPad logo. And the clearinghouse, of course, is this claim scrubber and submitting that's within our system. And that ties in with the patient portal because, Eric, everything that the patient wants to know about their uh, you know, records is right there in the patient portal. They can see everything. They can see the uh, prescriptions that they've had issued to them, uh, every procedure that the doctor has done. Everything's there for their examination. And you know, Patrick, I know we don't have it on this this 
uh, webinar today. But for those that have been doing any due diligence in, in franchises or business opportunities, and especially that in the medical world, uh, there is actually one more little connection between the electronic medical records and the patient portal. And for the, some that are pretty tech, tech savvy, savvy, there is a connection there that's called telemedicine that, that's already built inside of our system. So we don't even have that illustrated, but Patrick, there, there is the future. I mean, where the doctor can be at their office, the patient can be at their home and have a e-visit, so to say. Yeah, an electronic uh, discussion, just like you folks are watching this on the screen here with me and Eric in two different uh, video windows, that can happen between the patient and the doctor. That's mm -hmm. part of our patient portal. It's all built in there. Eric, do you know that there's a company selling a business opportunity that's just based on that one technology of patient uh, uh, telemedicine? We, that's we've already got it and have had it for a couple of years. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's already built in there. So, folks, that just put that into your memory bank again. Is, there's another added benefit. So real quickly, what we're going to do is just kind of, again, touch on these topics real quickly. iClaim is what we mentioned earlier. It's a practice management system. So it's more than just the billing. Patrick, a lot of people ask uh, when we're going through maybe a demonstration or we've kind of gotten off of another webinar, uh, does the doctor's office actually use iClaim as well? And the answer is yes. And Because basically what we're doing, we're replacing what they've got and putting this into their into their um, their office because this is the engine that's going to drive those types of numbers less than two percent rejection rates and getting those doctors paid within five to seven ten days. Right. So this is the system that you can actually see a live demo of. Uh, if you want to go back to the person who sent you the email inviting you to this webinar and ask them for a live one-on-one -on -one demo of our system. And we'll go through it and show it to you live, directly connected to the internet as if you were you know, doing the medical billing yourself. You'll get to see that and ask all the questions you want to about the system. You got it. Absolutely, we'd love to do that. And then we'll also demonstrate the EMRX, or the Electronic Medical Records platform too as well, which goes hand in hand with the medical billings. Imagine that the doctor's using an iPad, like Patrick was showing you just a moment ago, right in front of you, they're charting out this particular visit with the, their patient. They get through seeing Isabella Stevens, you can see her name right up there, uh, says that she's got a sore throat and this is what he's done, giving her a shot, check maybe for strep throat test, sends that, hits, hits the final thing on it, and as soon as that doctor hits that final part of it, it literally goes back into the billing system, right back up over here, again, ready for you to bill. So it's, it's, it keeps everything, what we talk about is human error free as possible. It's, it, the system's doing that all together. Yeah. And then with and, the clearinghouse being there, it's, it's, again, it's expediting those claims, getting out there to those, the, those payers in real time. Yeah, and I, don't, I know we've used the term cloud-based system, but just to make sure people are clear about that, Eric, it just means that the data doesn't reside on your computer at all. It's not on your hard drive. It's not in the memory of your computer. Well, it is until you push the button to go to the next screen. But the point is, this is all stored off-site on our servers. Folks, we have servers in two different electrical grids in the United States. So that if one goes down, the other one kicks in. They're redundant. They're called redundant, which means uh, the data can't be lost because it's on both systems almost simultaneously. And you can access it from any computer or iPad device or tablet anywhere in the world that has an Internet connection. It's just wonderful, a wonderful way to run a business. You can literally run this business from a beach in Hawaii, Eric. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and imagine if, now thinking about the patient portal, imagine trying to make sure that the patients have some type of software access. The, again, as Patrick is saying, this is all web-based. So everything that's connected between the doctor's office to you as the billing company to now the patient, uh, you can see here that the patient can literally schedule an appointment, they can check in there if they're going to go see the doctor today, they can go check in on that kind of that golden look big old tab there. They can request their medication refills, see medical records there. They can message the doctor, they can check on their their charges, pay their their balances online. And again, this is from the platform of where they can do the e-visit or the telemedicine part of it. Like Patrick said, they would show up with two video 
conferencing just right up at the top of there, right, right where it says your health your health file. So it's all all integrated. It's Eric, beautifully put together. Eric. Yes. No pressure. No pressure now. <laughs> but we have okay. eight minutes to cover about 20 more slides. So let's move through these next ones pretty quickly. You're going to show them how to process a claim, right? And then we've got a whole bunch of questions. I'm going to be reading those while you go through them. Absolutely. Good. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to process a claim. So whether you're a male, female, whatever background that you're in, let's kind of talk about real quickly how, again, you might even do the process of claims. Again, remember, some doctors may even still be using the old paper. You can still take that paper put it into the system, put it in there. So you, all you're going to do is go right up over here where it says uh, billing and you click on that, you click on those where it says enter charges and you click on professional claim charges. So you would take those numbers off of that super bill and input them into the system. You'd find the patient use, using the entire practice management system, put it in the system, put the numbers in there. We've got one, one there, an, an R05, that's a cough. Then we would put in the visits, what, what the doctor actually did. So on this particular one, this was a was called a level three type visit. You can see it's $114. There was some immunotherapy uh, that was given, one injection, basically that's what it was. Another $14 on that. Came out to $128 for this particular visit. At the end of that, you would scroll down and get down to this section where you create a claim. You'd click on that and you've created a claim. It really is that easy because at the same time you've created that claim, it's actually created it inside of the clearinghouse as well. And if it's done before 8 p.m. Pacific, Patrick, it's going to the payer the same day. So this is, I like to wrap it up with this. The doctor can see the patient today, get that information to you today, you as the billing company process it today, get it to the payer today. It's really the only system that can that actually can actually do that. Yes, uh, the only one that, that we know of anywhere in the United States. So, all right. Well, that was uh, good. You covered that very, very quickly. Now let's talk about uh, what did you put up the uh, the guarantee there, Eric? And we'll just talk about that just for a second, folks. We've decided that the only way that you'll know for sure if this is for real, because we could be telling you anything right now, right, is to come down here and spend a week in our training classroom. We'll let you go through the entire thing. We'll get, you'll give you all the handouts. You'll learn every proprietary information that we know about this business. And if at the end of the thing, you still don't think this is right for you, just ask for your money back. We've done it, haven't we, Eric? We've given people money back. Now, Absolutely. not many. It's about a handful in the last 23 years. But the point is, folks, that we want, it, we want you to be uh, rest assured that this is right for you. You're the only one, the final one, who makes that decision. And if it is, we'll give you all of your money back. Now that's the license fee that you paid to us, the $25,990. That's all we would refer to you, not the money that you spent on the hotel, which could be, you know, six, seven hundred dollars for the week or, or the, the flight if you had to fly here. But I don't know of any other company that does that, Eric. We're the only one that's willing to do that because we know what we have. Right.